Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. I'm Shana Hillman, she, her, the executive director for East End Arts. I'm a blonde woman, and I'm sitting in my dining room with yellow wallpaper behind me and a lot of holiday decorations. I think we can safely say this has been a year like no other. As an organization, we've had to pivot so many times this past year, we're starting to feel dizzy. Thankfully, there is now hope on the horizon with the arrival of vaccines, but we continue to be mindful of the ways we all need to change and adjust in a new post-COVID world. The pandemic has clearly revealed staggering inequities and pre-existing flaws in many of our systems. At East End Arts, we've acknowledged that even when a vaccination is available to everyone, we're still going to continue working in a hybrid in-person and digital way. And as such, we need to change how we work, where we work and how we design programs. This means embracing outdoor activity and encouraging everyone in Toronto to get some proper winter boots. One of our panelists told me uh, that Blundstones are not appropriate winter boots, even with the addition of wool socks. Um, communities like Edmonton, Ottawa, Quebec City, Denver, Prince Edward County, and of course, whole countries like Norway, Finland, Iceland have all embraced the winter and have cultures that celebrate winter. Toronto has been a bit slow in the uptake, but there have been some recent exciting announcements about enhanced and increased winter recreation activities in our public parks. Bathroom facilities are being kept open or temporary ones brought in for parks where the bathrooms aren't winterized. And there's investigations about all city patios. I'd like to thank the Department of Canadian Heritage for supporting today's event and our pivot. Uh, pivot is the secret word of today, by the way, if you get that very dated reference, um, through their Spark Grant program. And now I'd like to introduce some very important people who have joined us today. Our MP for Toronto Danforth and the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Canadian Heritage, Julie Dimbruzen. It's important to note Julie is also a fierce park person and lover of community fire pits, including founding with a group of community members, the one that's in Withrow Park. Uh, Beach's East York Councillor Brad Bradford, another champion of Torontonians getting outside, who's been on the forefront of the Active TO and the Destination Danforth campaigns and is deeply involved with our BIAs and making sure the small and local businesses that make up our main streets can weather this COVID storm. We're so glad you're both here. I would like to remind folks that this day is meant to be a fun brainstorm to get us all inspired, including Julie and Brad. And that if you have a specific constituent issue, maybe save it for after the session. I'd like to introduce Chelsea Cameron Fickus, who is the communications manager at East End Arts. If you've ever interacted with us on social media, it was Chelsea you were dealing with or she was directing it. She makes sure we sound smart and thoughtful in everything we do. And today she'll be helping us moderate the chat and feeding your questions to the panel. There were no requests for ASL interpretation or closed captioning for this session, but we will be recording the event today and it will be available on YouTube with closed captioning following the event. For the first half of our event, only our panelists will be unmuted. We recommend you set your screen to speaker view up in the top right of your screen. If you have a question for the panel, we ask that you use the chat box and we're hoping to get through as many as possible. After the panel, you'll be broken out into four different breakout groups for brainstorming. Each group will have a moderator and we're going to ask that one person in each group take notes and to report back to the larger group. If you do not feel comfortable being seen on screen, by all means, please turn your video off. Now I'd like to turn this over to Adam Barrett, East End Arts' program coordinator and the amazing creative curator for this entire event, who will now lead us in a land acknowledgement. Adam? Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Adam Barrett. My pronouns are he, him, or they, and them. And as Shana said, I'm the programming coordinator at East End Arts. And I want to start today by saying that East End Arts acknowledges that our work takes place on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. East Toronto is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inui and Métis people. And we also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, signed by the Mississaugas of the Credit, and the Williams Treaty, signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. In keeping with those treaties, East End Arts is committed to the ongoing stewardship of the land. And one of the ways that we do this is by striving to create waste-free programming. And we encourage those of you working in our shared sp spaces, like parks, to do the same. Another of the ways that we do this is by encouraging the telling of stories and the making of art that engages directly with the landscape in our neighborhoods. Because we know 
that a greater understanding of that landscape will lead to a greater respect for the traditional stewards of this land to whom we are all so deeply indebted. I'm thrilled to see many of you here today share these values and I'm really excited to hear what your ideas are for how we can make our, um, our city a vibrant four season one. And I know it's only Monday, so we aren't all at max Zoom breakdown levels yet, but I wanna start before we, uh, we, we get going with the panel. I'm gonna invite everyone as you're able to join me in something to just loosen us all up before we start using our imaginations. I want everyone to hike their shoulders way up as high as you can get them all the way up there and then we're going to count one two three four five and release and now i don't care if you have sweaty office chair armpits i do lift your arms all the way up all the way up as high as you can sitting in your chair wiggle a little bit stretch out the left side stretch out the right side show off those armpits earn those sweat stains and release okay jack will jump in the pond <laughs> now hopefully everybody's shoulders have dropped a bit and we're all paying attention and i'm going to dive us into meeting our first panelist Alan Colley is a storyteller and nature guide from Toronto Indigenous Eco Tours. He shares information re regarding history and nature to inspire communities to look towards a healthy future by planting seeds in the present. Alan says, every time a participant resonates with a teaching provided, the Indigenous knowledge of my ancestors and the ancestors of all Aboriginal peoples is honoured because it get, it has a chance to expand into future generations. I've had the great privilege of working with Alan Colley before. Alan, thank you so much for joining us today, all the way from snowy Havelock. How are you doing? Are you I'm there? doing great. Uh, miigwech. Uh, thank you uh, for giving me this time. Uh, we say uh, in life, uh, the gift that we have is time. Uh, so we're born, we're given time and we pass. And so we say that we're the reflection uh, in that experience of what, uh, as I would think of art, uh, is how we express uh, that inner part of our personalities and characters and stories uh, through all those beautiful medias that creation has given us. Uh, and so for myself, I want to say Wainana Bojo, Chichak, and Vidishnikaz, Maingan Dodem. Right now, Giwaden Zibi, a Dunjiba, is that I'm currently staying up here by the North River in Havelock, but originally I'm from Toronto. Uh, and so, you know, as, as a person growing up in the city, uh, you know, I spent so much time, any chance I could, in a park, ravine, uh, trying to connect with the outdoors. And so Toronto really uh, is such a gem, uh, and there's so much uh, story to it. And so right now, uh, around me, if we just uh, take a look, you can see all that beautiful snow, uh, that, that, that winter, uh, that bee bone uh, that, is, that is coming. Uh, you know, winter hasn't even started yet. <laughs> we wait until uh, this full month. Um, but right now, as Indigenous people, we looked uh, to our artists uh, as those storytellers, uh, those creators, those ones uh, that wanted to pass on uh, not only, you know, a, uh, uh, you know, a display of, uh, you know, acting and song and dance, uh, but also that moral, uh, you know, that, that deeper level of connection. And so right now with the snow that's falling, uh, all these beings uh, that are out here are taking that time uh, to reflect on themselves, uh, to reflect on the year uh, that we've had, um, but also uh, to, to start thinking about those ideas for next year. Uh, and so I think this is a really great opportunity that you've put forth here uh, to give participants that opportunity to brainstorm and really collaborate. Um, because we see as people that gift uh, we have is that uh, when we're in that circle, uh, together, you know, we're all side by side in this, uh, and we're all able to do such beautiful things. Uh, and so I'm very honored uh, to share that experience uh, in any way that I can. Uh, and also for everybody that's here today, as we, you know, we're all stuck inside, I'm going to be going inside shortly, um, is spend as much time as you can uh, out, uh, out in the parks, out in the ravine, going for a walk, uh, and uh, getting that fresh air, uh, and connecting to creation. Because we say that, you know, if you listen to those birds, uh, you'll hear those songs, you'll hear those sounds uh, that we all have a chance to give thankful. And we all have different voices. We all sing differently, but, you know, um, but as well, uh, the plants, the colors, uh, the vibrations, uh, all those 
uh, bugs and animals that when we think of uh, those feelings are shown in so many different ways. Uh, and so in the winter, uh, now is a time to share your stories, uh, sit with your, or share with your friends, your family, everybody you can, and also listen to the old ones, you know, try and try and get them to bring back those memories as well, because that winter is really this time that we gather and we share. Uh, and that we have that magic uh, to doing that. And so I'm very honored and I want to say miigwech. Uh, and so uh, for everybody here, we say uh, bon appétit. Uh, I'm not going to say goodbye because hopefully uh, we'll get to meet and do some amazing uh, creative things because really uh, the world, uh, as you choose to vision it, is your, your tapestry of whatever media you want to, to share your experience with. Uh, and so, yeah, miigwech. And I'll pass it back to Adam. Um, thank you, Alan. And um, I'm going to just check in with Chelsea. Do we have, I don't have my eyes on the chat. Do we have any questions from the chat for Alan before he goes and gets warm inside? No, but I do have a, another question for him. It's not necessarily directly from the chat, but he might be interested in answering. Yeah. Well, um, absolutely. Alan, can you tell us a bit about some of the wintertime traditional practices or stories of the first people of what we call Toronto? So Toronto uh, is a very, uh, very interesting place uh, with a lot of uh, different relations uh, that are in story. Uh, and so I think of Toronto uh, originally, you know, and some of the beautiful things that happen is this, this time of gathering uh, would very soon lead us into uh, our, our sugar bush. Uh, and so Toronto has a lot of beautiful uh, history and opportunity within the land. And so uh, one of the things that I've been, you know, trying to look at is that there's an old sugar bush at Keelan Shepherd. Uh, and so it's an opportunity for artists and, and community to come together uh, to, to tell those stories. And so as an Indigenous perspective in that wintertime, you know, really uh, is the time that you can share. And so there's many stories within our stories of uh, legends and the beings within those legends. Uh, and so really, if you ever get that chance to, to listen to some of those storytellers. And so Isaac Murdoch uh, does a lot of really good uh, storytelling. Um, if, you're, if you're able to look into him and see some of the different stories that he shares. But yeah. So it is hot then. Thank you, Alan. That was fantastic. I've made notes. <laughs> oh, Blue's going to just. Sounds like maybe Alan's camera assistant is getting a bit uh, a bit chilly. So why don't you guys go inside, hop onto the the inside computer, and we'll uh, we'll see you in a couple minutes. Okay. Great. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you so much, Alan. Um, now I'd like to introduce our second panelist. Um, Simon O'Byrne is an award-winning urban designer and planner and vice president of community development for Stantec Canada. With his planning expertise, he's frequently quoted in North American media. He's regularly sought out and a regularly sought after public speaker. He's been the co-chair of Edmonton's Winter City Strategy and is a lover of winter events. Thanks so much for joining us, Simon. You have a long history of encouraging people to embrace four city season, four season cities, and we are thrilled to have you here. Hi everyone, how are you doing? Um, wish you all well in, uh, in Toronto. I'm here from uh, snowy uh, Edmonton where it's been really cold. Uh, well, it was actually a week ago, uh, it was actually 10 degrees above and yesterday it was uh, minus 21 before the wind chill. So yeah, <laughs> a 30 plus degree swing in temperature in a short period of time. So. Um, but I hope everyone is well. I, I want, I'm going to do a quick presentation, um, highlight a couple things about winter city design. So I, I work as a, I'm an urban planner, urban designer. I've done work in Europe and North America about creating great places that are hopefully worthy of people's affection. That's aspirationally what I like to do mostly is um, create those places that people care about and, and think of fondly and bring them to light and hope and joy and, and equity if we can. Um, so 
I'm going to share some of the things that we've learned in the seven, eight years that have been the chair of both the Winter City Initiative in Edmonton and also the Winter City design aspect of it. One of the things that um, it's, I'm going to share my screen here. So um, hopefully everyone can thumbs up that we can all see it okay. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, so it's really, it's, it's kind of shocking to me and I've done this in New York and I've done this in Denver and Boston and, and um, all over Canada. And it surprises me, people somehow think that unless you're in Winnipeg or in Edmonton, you don't have to do four season design. And I see this when I go to Toronto regularly. I went to grad school in New York and my wife went to grad school in Toronto. Um, and the thing that surprised me was that it seemed like the Toronto really kind of put all its, all its eggs just in the summer basket and not enough in the winter basket. And so the festivals were all about the summer and not enough about the winter. Um, the parks uh, were all were almost erroneously presumed that nobody used them in winter time and all the energy was going to the summer. But the reality is that winter is one of the longest seasons of the year in Canada. And one of the things we discovered with what we're doing with winter cities in Edmonton was that um, way more people were using our parks in the middle of winter than we thought when we actually did a surveys. And when you try to create great public spaces that are worthy of people's affection, uh, you have to almost start with the premise, how do I make this place successful in the middle of January? Because if I can make it successful in the middle of January, it'll do exceedingly well in July. It requires no effort to get Canadians to go outside in July but you have to be very deliberate and purposeful in how you design to get people to go outside and stay outside in January. So we, we started blowing up the narrative. So rather than simply saying, well, let's, let's simply you know, put all our energy in our summer festivals, well, arguably it's more important that we have successful winter festivals because people are gonna to flock to our summer festivals regardless in the summer because they just like to be outside doing that. We have to be much more thoughtful about how we're gonna lure them outside and keep them there in the middle of winter. Likewise, we have to think as a winter city, uh, what are we gonna do that's gonna make people um, really enjoy winter the way that they did when they're a child? Nobody when, there was ten year, when they were 10 years old went to their mom or dad and, and said, you know, what temperature is it? They simply threw on their snowsuit, a toque and gloves, and they went outside to go tobogganing or skating and do activities. How do we re-embrace that love of winter that we had when we were 10? Nowadays, too much, we simply go, okay, the closest I can get from, uh, from transit or wearing to park my car to the entrance of where I'm gonna go is this far. So what is the least amount of clothing I can wear to get from here to here? Um, it, as opposed to saying, well, how about a, loitering outside for a couple hours and dressing appropriately to be outside for hours and then. So how do we design our cities for that? How do we also have fun embracing fashion? And one of the things we actually started to do is in, encourage the local fashion industry here in Edmonton to celebrate more um, winter clothing and winter style and fashion and actually have uh, we've actually had fashion shows in January and February that were outside at nighttime. Um, so how do you actually kind of do those kind of fun things? Um, a lot of what we did kind of culminated in, um, in some great studies and reports. All of it is available on the City of Edmonton's website, which I very much encourage you to go see. Uh, crib all the ideas you want from them, both the urban design aspects of it and the aspects about embracing a winter economy, uh, arts, how the arts and, and cultural community can benefit from it. Everything from using theatrical lights and uh, to take drab, boring places and use them and turn them into places that could have dramatic, vibrant, whimsical, uh, and magical um, illumination of spaces that are dark. Um, so please go to these websites, have a look at them and embrace them. A lot of Winter City design really comes down to five things at the end of the day. So one of them is blocking the wind that is absolutely paramount because uh, I've been in Toronto during the dead of winter and I, it, could be, it could only be minus two, but with the wind blowing off the lake and the many of the buildings that amplify the wind, it could be worse being in Toronto at minus two than it can be to be in Edmonton at minus 15 with a, a dry prairie uh, cold where it's blue sky and sunny and, and um, but it's very dry and it's there's not that much wind. 
at least where I am, and as a result, it's not that bad, but I've been in Toronto where it's minus two, and that wind is so punishing and cruel in, in that how it hits you. So a lot of winter city design is, the most important thing is blocking the wind. Next thing is how do you put people in the sun as much as possible? That's really critical because you have to be able to put people in the sun. But if you have to make a trade-off decision, it's more important to kind of to mute and to block the wind because it's also the darkest time of the year. So there isn't that much sunlight. Embracing color a lot more. Too many architects, when we see them design spaces, they always do the rendering. This is though every day is July 1st and they never do the rendering showing how is it gonna look in the middle of January? Well, a lot of what we have to do about creating great buildings and public spaces is what are they gonna look like in January? How do we create um, a dynamic, interesting space? How do we use color more? How do we use lighting more? How do we embrace uh, architectural infrastructure different? So there's all kinds of things we can do, do in terms of design. One of the buildings I love the most is the Aqua Tower in Chicago, the tallest building in the world designed by a female architect, 84 stories tall, right on Lake Michigan, right beside Maggie Daly Park, if you know where that is. And it's uh, just to the north of Maggie Daly. And it's this beautiful building. And they did the complex wind modeling so that it was not going to be windy at all at ground floor, despite being 84 stories, stories tall. Um, they muted out the wind. Um, and that was a real kind of interesting design to me and real kind of that you don't have to do just a wedding cake design to diffuse the wind. You can model it differently. The other thing we've learned in Edmonton with, uh, with wind studies is that you can't do a wind study in isolation. You have to look at all the, you have to look at all the surrounding neighborhood and how do the buildings create wind from one another? Because you can do, um, you can add one more building in the area and it can, it can have a much more adverse impact than we think because we have to look at the cumulative effects of how all the buildings work together. So in one case, there's a, there's a tower in Vancouver that was done and yes, it did all kinds of beautiful things to mute the wind, but all it did was redirect the wind to the other side of the street. So below that side of the street, there was no wind, but the other side just got blasted because the wind was getting redirected off the building. So we have to design buildings and such. So it's not just good for the people at the base of that building, but also realize that interrelationship between the different buildings and do much more complex nuanced wind modeling that looks at the the cumulative effects of all the wind within the surrounding and immediate area. We can also put in uh, colonnades and loggias and other things that provide an opportunity for people to be protected from the wind. We can do berms and landscaping and change that so that can be better. The other thing that I think the Toronto and, and the GTA can do a lot more of is that the alleys have really been abandoned. And I look at what Melbourne, Australia has done or Victoria, British Columbia have done. Um, you can create alleys and make them these magical places that could be well illuminated. They could become these safe passages to get from A to B that are sometimes shorter routes. You can do them so they don't have to be just where all the, the garbage and, and back of house operations are located. You can actually beautify them. You can actually make them places where you can put up theatrical lighting and make these dark places into some into some magical places. Likewise, you can have commerce in there. You can have restaurants and outdoor patios, commerce in them. And the nice thing about uh, doing uh, back alleys and turning them into places that are proper corridors and, and having that mentality is that they provide refuge from the wind because they're, they're much more narrow and protected from the wind. They become more comfortable to go on than necessarily our widest, but biggest boulevards. Likewise, we have to capture the sun. We have to do much more complex uh, sunlight shadow uh, in modeling so that we can put people in the sun. And we have to make sure that we protect those parks and keep public spaces and we don't uh, surround them in towers and such that they're gonna be um, not able to be able to enjoy the sun in the middle of winter. Like I said earlier, we have to embrace color. There's a reason that the Northern Scandinavian cultures, when we think of them, when we think of the architectural vernacular of them, the, we immediately think of a color palette. Even when you think of Newfoundland and St. John's, we think of those colorful, beautiful fishing towns in, in Newfoundland, and immediately we think of the color that comes to mind. Well, you know, when you, you realize the Newfoundland climate, it makes perfect sense to have a lot of color. Well, we can have some fun with it. We can embrace that as well. Likewise, we can use much more creative lighting. There's so many uh, there's so much uh, innovation that's happened in terms of LED lighting, theatrical lighting that we can use as both temporary and permanent installations, whether it's in a public park, 
whether it's the side of a building, whether it's architectural lighting, whether it's a blank facade of a canvas that really is otherwise kind of drab, you can use the palette of darkness and turn into something that could be magical and fun and enhance the public realm. You can do things that make a statement, whether it's political, artistic, you can do those with places. Likewise, embracing uh, winter infrastructure. So having more outdoor fireplaces, more places for people to go skating, having um, movable uh, fire pits, um, embracing things like um, winter cycling is really critical. One of the things that's kind of surprised me with Toronto when I've gone there is that too many of the bike lanes are simply, there's just the delineation that's been made with simply having paint down. Well, if you are, if you are, unless you're the Lycra crowd, that's not, that's not cutting it. Maybe if you're in Lycra and you're, you're okay with being in that kind of dangerous space, you're fine with it. But when you think of all the grit and salt and other things that ends up on that paint, there's not a strong enough delineation between that and, and the vehicle. So it's really critical that we have planters or concrete barriers or some other kind of barrier that kind of follows that 880 principle so that we're segregating the cyclists mm -hmm. from, the, from, the, from the vehicles so that if there's black ice and other things, people don't have to worry about their bikes slipping out from underneath them. And drivers know which is the, the cycling realm. It's really critical that we do that. If we do that, we can have transformation just like the Scandinavian countries have been able to do where they have uh, better in, you know, in Copenhagen and Amsterdam, Rotterdam and, and Harlem in the Netherlands and Denmark, uh, greater than 50% of the population cycles year round. And nobody in Copenhagen would think that they have a great climate. They have like the opposite of like a California climate. It's really, Copenhagen averages something like more than 20 days every month of either snow, rain, or sleet, 20 days a month. So hardly a climate that really lends itself towards cycling year round, yet 65% of all trips in Copenhagen are done by bike. Um, so if they can do it and their work weather is far worse than Toronto's, there's no excuse for Toronto not embracing winter culture, uh, winter cycling culture, but just doing a lot smarter. Likewise, um, we have to design intersections and infrastructure different. We need to put, we need to design them so that w that ugly brown pool of um, water doesn't pool next to our intersections, that they drain away really quickly. So we model in how the catch basins can be different so that they can drain away quickly the snow and ice and leaves so that they don't clog up. Because I can tell you, if you're in a wheelchair and you are um, in, a, in a walker like my dad was before he passed away, it is impossible to get through some of these intersections. They're horrible. One of the things we've noticed is that a lot of people who are in wheelchairs prefer to use bike lanes rather than use the sidewalks because the crosswalks don't work for them in wintertime. They work for them in the summertime, but the crosswalks don't work very well during the middle of winter because of the drainage issues and the snow and ice issues. So if you're in a, in a wheelchair, it is much more comfortable to use the bike lane. Um, that's a result of poor engineering and poor, um, poor thinking about infrastructure. And if we wanna have equitable, equitable cities for all, so it's not just for, the, for those that are physically healthy, but it's for everybody in society to be inclusionary. We have to design the infrastructure differently. We also need to have things like raised crosswalks so that the crosswalk areas drain away differently. And then there's bulb outs so that the pedestrian area from A to B is as narrow as it possibly can and steal that away from traffic. Likewise, we have to embrace building design differently, use an aesthetic that really makes us feel warm, not cold. When we see glass and we see steel, that makes us feel cold. But when we see materials like wood and certain colors, they 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 make us feel much more warmer. Same thing with, there's a reason that if you go to Italy that with their heat back in the day, they had loggias, these kind of covered areas. Well, we can use that as well in our designs. Likewise, we can have uh, colonnades and canopies that protect us from the wind and snow. We can have building entrances designed so that they're more colorful, so that they're designed so that snow and ice aren't going to fall away from them. I remember going to Boston a couple of years ago to the in um, on the MIT campus, uh, there was a, a building designed by um, uh, um, uh, Frank Gehry, and uh, seven of the eight entrances were closed during the winter months because of falling ice problems. So Starkitect went and designed a beautiful building on the MIT campus, but guess what? Never thought about how it performed in the middle of winter. They just presumed they just thought about how it worked in the middle of the summertime. Well. That's, that's, that kind of failure should never happen. 
we need to design entrances to buildings that we're thinking about following so and I said they're more um, they're smart at design the image you see on the left is the Edmonton has a, a, um, a, a francophone portion of the city where our, we have a French university here in Edmonton and a French uh, district in Edmonton and there's a whole faculty around it in, uh, in where the bibliothèque is located and there's a the French theater and so forth and this is part of that part of one of those buildings they actually designed the building so that the predominant wind in Edmonton that's horrible is from the north and the jet stream goes from west to east in Canada. So the worst winds are from the northwest. So they designed the building so that the back of the building was going to have its back turned towards that cruel northwest wind. The building was going to be more sunken so it was below grade so that it would be sheltered from the wind. And this area at the bottom uh, left of the building where the entrance is is where there's actually an outdoor, uh, there's now a big outdoor uh, uh, there's a Cafe Bicioclet, which is this beautiful French bistro, and it has outdoor seating for maybe 75 people, and they use it all year round now because it's protected from the wind and because there's fire pits there and people want to go there. So it becomes this magical place. We also need to see a better relationship with, between what's happening inside and outside the building. I remember going to Paris in January one year when it was minus 17. It was one of the worst cold spells Paris had had in some time. But a surprise that the patios were open in the middle of winter time. And the reason that they're open was because there's a, there's a plastic curtain that was see-through that they'd pull around. There was a faux fur uh, sitting on your chair. So when you sat down, you're sitting in the faux fur. They had a blanket that put on your lap. In COVID, I think we have to embrace a BYOB, except it's bring your own blanket. And you could sit outside, and so um, we, and so I was able to have a meal outside during minus 17, and there's still some air movement. But the important thing was that the curtain blocked um, the bulk of the wind. But you could see, then you could see all the Parisian street life going by, and they could see you. Um, and you can use uh, gas or electric lamps uh, um, that, that can create further warmth as well. So changing the aesthetics, changing the material, using street furniture that's warmer, um, and thinking about in areas where snow really does pile up. So how does that, what's the point of having street furniture if the, if the snow is two or three feet high? So we have to think about those things and those considerations and change our, and change our designs. Too much of Toronto when you go to it, um, it does not have adequate spaces for trees. And, and the boulevards aren't big enough to me. And what's really critical is you need a both, both a place to store snow in the middle of winter and a place that when you get those freeze, uh, freeze uh, cycles where it freezes and melts and you get the pooling water and you get that slush and a bus goes by, a truck goes by and it sprays the pedestrians. Well, that's just the consequence of not having created that buffer zone that should be created with trees. Not only does that beautify the city, especially in the summer months, but it provides a necessary shelter for people during the middle of winter time. So we need to do those interventions. We need also, we can't expect transit ridership to be really high and successful if we don't create adequate places for people to be sheltered from uh, shelter from snow and wind and other things. Transit shelters are absolutely paramount and should, should be absolutely unacceptable to have a transit stop that doesn't have a proper shelter for people. Um, same thing, wayfinding. As it's dark for six months of the year, we have to put light into our wayfinding. We can't just presume it's going to work in all seasons. It's going to have to, it has to work in, in, um, in this be visible even when it's dark. One of the things that we've kind of borrowed in Edmonton and a lot of cities have started to do, and you see this in the beaches in Toronto, is um, in, it, it started really in Winnipeg with the Red River. So the Red River in Winnipeg freezes and then they plow it and you can go um, skating like uh, like um, the, the famous song, The River you can, uh, by Joni Mitchell. You can go skating for miles on the Red River in Winnipeg and they've got these beautiful warming huts and architectural design competitions to see who can design the best warming hut. And I love that concept that we need to put these more in our public parks, whether they're for uh, whether they're for people who are living rough or they're for people um, who are not, that there's places for them to warm up and there's places for them to get away from horrible uh, weather. Same thing with landscaping. One of the things that our landscape architects complain about is that it, everything's designed just for July, but we have to also think about how does that vegetation look in the middle of uh, January? Can we use more ornamental grasses and bushes that hold their colors and maybe they've got 
red and orange colored um, uh, wood in them that make it that add some color in the middle of winter. How do we use them with berms and with trees and coniferous trees as well so that they, they buffer the wind in the middle of winter? A lot of this really comes down to simply having all season building and spaces and really to, to think critically of those that design spaces. How do they perform in all four seasons? How do they perform in spring? How do they perform in the summer in the winter time? And not just presume that every day is July 1st. And I'm gonna finish up here, um, the last couple slides here, which is, we, we've seen a lot of discussion on winter patios, a lot of discussions on, on uh, parklets, and we have to expand those. We have to do much more of that, like the example in Paris, the things you can do with heaters and providing protection. Uh, Paris has had competitions for who could design the best winter uh, terraces outside buildings and restaurants. We need to kind of embrace that type of whimsical thinking in our cities. It's really critical. Um, and COVID won't be around forever and, and the restrictions that we have won't be around forever. But one of the things that will be around forever is the need for us to congregate and live in cities and we need to be able to provide those protections. And just to also finish up here, fire and is so critical. I remember going to the distillery district a few times and going in there, having a meal, leaving two hours later, and the same people are sitting outside around a fire. People will sit outside in Toronto during the middle of winter for hours, as long as there's a fire there. We love to sit around fire. Even if the fire doesn't actually physically make us feel warm, just seeing fire psychologically makes us feel warm. And you do that with a combination of BYOB, bring your own blanket, and people will sit outside and congregate, but we need to have more examples of this. Winnipeg did this recently in the fall where they started putting in movable fire pits and Adirondack chairs, and they put Edison bulb stringers across the, uh, the forks in Winnipeg, and people would go outside and do this. So imagine doing this much more with parks in Toronto so that people could go outside and, and sit at these areas. It just, we have to create more, play, more think about how people use space year round. So when it is darker and colder, what are we gonna do that's gonna make them wanna sit outside and use these spaces? And a lot of it comes down to just constantly think about how do people live life? Um, what does their life look like? How do we make it better? How do we make it much more inclusionary for, for children as well in the middle of winter? Because as a, as a parent of a, a, a 10 year old and 15 year old, I can tell you that if the kids are happy and they're not squabbling, then, then I'm a lot happier because if they're squabbling, <laughs> life's not so fun. Um, so I think that one of the things you can do is um, think about cities differently and about how you can create fun. And the last thing I wanna finish on is that everyone somehow thinks that when you do design excellence and you embrace design excellence, that you have to spend a monumental amount of arc money. You have to, just, to bring in star architects and spend a spectacular amount of money. Well, there was a horrible, ugly underpass in Germany that nobody wanted to use as a pedestrian or cyclist. Um, people didn't feel it safe there. And they wanted to come up with an idea for what would make people want to use this underpass. And they had a design competition for the underpass. And the person that won it came up with the idea that to repaint the underpass so it looked like Lego bricks that were all put together. Well, they spent $1,000 on paint and they now receive over 20 million visitors a year to go photograph themselves beside the Lego bridge. So people come from around the world to photograph themselves beside the Lego bridge in this small town of 50,000 people in Germany, 20 million. So millions of visitors come to see it. Why? Because Lego is the single most popular toy on the planet. The point here is that somehow we don't have to about, it's not about spending money, it's simply about ingenuity and creativity. There's a famous mayor in Brazil that said, if you really want creativity, take a zero off the budget. And I think about the people that are on this, this uh, call, the Zoom call, that come from the arts community in East Toronto. And I think it's really, if there's, if there's a group that has creativity and ingenuity, it's this group. And again, it's not just about money, it's about, leveraging the talent that's uh, that's in this part of Toronto to make these spaces much better in winter and to do some something fun and magical and whimsical with that. So thank you very much for your time and for uh, listening to my presentation. That's great. Thank you so much, Simon. Thank you. I, um, I think there's all kinds of really like big high level stuff in there for us to think about. And um, I'm sure there were a couple of questions in the chat. Chelsea, did you want to do your magic with the chat thing. I'm not even looking at it. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, there were actually a lot of great questions. I feel like Simon addressed a couple um, in the last little, oh, the sun is suddenly 
very bright. Oh, wow, look at you. Look at me in the winter. Um, because he talked about fires and he talked about um, you know, some low cost ways, I think, to implement some of those. So I'll go, I think, to the first question that was asked, which is what kind of structure would you recommend to block the wind and capture the sun and at the same time be open, COVID-19, for an outdoor exhibition in the winter? Do you have any examples? Well, a, a couple things. So an outdoor exhibition, I think one of them is to have more, you know, on the other side of COVID when it's better. Another way to do it when there's, there, there can be restrictions, but maybe a little less than we have at, at the moment in Canada, um, which is to have like what you have in the distillery district where you have in Nuremberg, Germany, which is like Christmas markets uh, or Bryant Park in New York, to have those kind of outdoor park markets. People love outdoor markets. And one of the things that we were surprised of when we working on the Winter City is that Moscow's uh, outdoor farmers markets go year round. They never shut down. They simply might change who the vendors are or what they're selling. Uh, but you can go to Moscow during the middle of a minus 30. It could be minus 30 outside in February in Moscow. And the farmer's markets are still active. And people are selling fruit. It literally freezes. So they literally buy frozen produce, bring it home, thaw it up, and then use it that same day. You know, because it, once it freezes and then unthaws, it won't, it'll spoil quicker. But they basically use it that same day. Um, and so what was interesting to me was that they didn't shut down and and somehow we've become soft in Canada. Like I said, we don't dress appropriately to be outside during the middle of winter. And that, so a lot of this is also about how do we embrace fashion differently and, yeah. and think about being, have some fun with the style of it and with um, addressing to be outside uh, for hours on end and to be able to do that. So that that's part of it. And then about the, then the other thing about buildings and spaces is to make sure that we're, always locating people um, where they're going to be in the sun. And so where there is uh, a chance to make a trade-off decision, where's the public park going to be or the, uh, the patio going to be, that we're always um, deviating towards the, uh, where it's, we're done the sunlight shadow modeling and we're going to put people so that they're sitting in the sun. Um, we can, uh, buildings, new buildings have to be designed to kind of mute the wind and older buildings have to be designed to do interventions, whether it's um, uh, awnings and other things that are going to redirect the wind away from where pedestrians are. Because one of the things that I think we've all experienced in the, in the middle of winter in Toronto is that uh, the level of wind is just, is the killer. It, and it's, you walk around some corners and all of a sudden you get blasted with um, horrifically cold wind. And we have to be able to design our, our buildings more. And we have to use things like uh, coniferous trees and other things where there can be landscape interventions as well, not just hard interventions as well. Um, Amazing. Thank you, Simon. I think I, I could probably sit and pick your brain about winter all afternoon, but I'm going to move us along to our next incredible panelist. Um, and uh, uh, Kay is joining us from snowy Ottawa. I don't know if it's actually snowy there right now, uh, where she's worked as part of the event planning team responsible for Winterlude, Canada Day, Christmas Lights Across Canada, as well as the Canada 150 opening and closing celebrations on Parliament Hill. She's the Senior Project Coordinator at Canadian Heritage for the Frankfurt 2020-2021 project, where Canada is the guest of honor country at the Frankfurt Book Fair. Kay, thank you for joining us. Uh, you've been part of planning some really incredible, really big outdoor events in the winter time. And uh, I'm hoping that you can talk to us today about some of the logistics of planning winter events. Um, why don't we start? Tell us a little bit about some of the work that you've done that took place in winter weather in Ottawa. And, uh, and we'll get started there. Sure. Um, so Winterlude was um, first created in 1979 and it spans both the Ottawa and Gatineau side. Um, of the National Capital Region. And the whole reason why it was created was to bring people out in winter time to come and celebrate, be outdoors, um, come together as a community, as well as uh, to support the local businesses, to get the people to come out and, and create that sort of um, impetus that, you know, right in the middle of winter uh, when everybody tends to hunker down, stay home. So, um, it's not so much what I have done, but I'll speak to what Winterlude has done and the kind of things that were, that uh, the event is known for. So there are three sort of 
programming core elements. Um, as everybody knows, Ottawa has the longest skating rink, the Rideau Canal. So that's one of the anchor elements that we use um, to that, you know, we know people are coming out to come skating. Um, so that's one thing. The second, uh, there are two other, um, I'm going to quote, winter elements that are out there that we use as our primary programming elements. Uh, so that would be ice and snow. Um, and, and so in the Ottawa side, there tends to be the international ice carving competition. There'll be ice sculpture focal points. Um, there'll be activities with ice, like ice digs and, um, uh, you know, little cubes of ice that kids can play with. And then over on the Gatineau side at Jacques Cartier Park, it would be more about the snow where you have previously in the past, there was a national school sculpt snow sculpting competition, but now there isn't, but there's still some snow sculptures and focal points. And of course there are the big giant snow slides. So Jacques Cartier Park Snowflake Kingdom has been dubbed as the largest snow uh, playground. Um, and so and it's very geared towards families. It's very family friendly, but it's the ephemeral art. And I think this is the thing that really draws people into it. Um, and as those are the anchor points, then we bring in all the other programming elements, like we've had music performances, the stage actually on the Rideau Canal across from the National Arts Centre long ago, um, where we had major art, Canadian artists coming out performing in winter with a tempered stage because um, ask any guitarist if they want to play their steel strings outside, not something that they want to do, um, in, especially when there's wind chill. Um, so, but the other great thing that Winterlude does is it really brings the community together. And um, while there are official sites that are planned by the, the core Winterlude team, it also relies a lot on community programming. And so there we have, you know, historical um, that have been with us for years, for instance, the bed race on the Rideau Canal, which is run by the Kiwanis um, uh, Club of Ottawa. It's a fundraising event that they do. Um, we have the stew cook-off uh, run by the Byward Market BIA, where all the restaurants participate and you know, uh, uh, submit their stews, public can vote on it, there's a judging panel, and then those restaurants then also serve that stew throughout the month of Winterlude. Um, there's also sporting events. So you have the Gatineau Lopet, which is cross country skiing. You have the Winterman Marathon. You have the uh, Winterlude Triathlon, which was skating on the Rideau Canal, uh, cross country skiing and running. Um, and, and of course, the, you know, the food element. Uh, Winterlude is synonymously known. If you're coming out, you're also gonna, chances are have a beaver tail or poutine, right? So there's, there's all these things that people love and, and it's, it creates those memories um, that, that people come back year after year. Amazing, I love that. And I think, I think it's exciting to think about the kind of seeds that we can plant to make those memories that return. I wonder, thinking about, about logistics and how we kind of plan a little bit long-term, and I think everyone in this room is a bit of a, a, bit of a long-term planner. Um, I'm wondering, what's the first thing that you think about when you're initiating a planning process for something in the winter time? So um, I'm gonna step back and say, just like any event that you do, any artistic production, you're always thinking about the vision right? It comes down to what is the vision, regardless of winter, because once that's clear, then you can communicate that to and, and leverage that when you approach your sponsors, you approach your partners, um, because you need their buy-in. Um, when it comes to winter, it really requires the buy-in of everybody and collaborating. And also it makes it a lot easier to communicate to, to your to your public and, and gain the interest because what is that experience that you wanna bring? You know, Simon talked about creating those magical moments and those are the things that you want to consider. And then from there, that's when I do a lot of my, you know, we as a team would do a lot of brainstorming, looking and doing research to see what are, you know, we asked, we, we looked to be curious and we asked the question, what is the Canadian winter experience? You know, where we have, you know, 10 provinces, three territories, and how we celebrate winter, even within Canada, is very different and diverse. So, you know, we look and question that. We look at other cultures around the world. What are they doing? 
Um, and that also plays into the, the programming ideas. Um, and then also, you know, thinking about Canadian newcomers to Canada who've never perhaps experienced winter at all, and this is their first experience. What is it, what is it the awe-inspiring moment or, you know, winter is magical. Like I've got snow that's gently falling down. And, and then when you've got ice sculptures and you've got snow sculptures, there's just something larger than life and magical about winter that, you know, that's the sort of feeling that you want to evoke and inspire in people. I have never wished so badly for it to snow. That's beautiful. And it brings me to my next question for you, Kay. How do you, how do you have a weather plan when you're already planning for weather? Like, I guess what I mean is, how much winter is too much winter? So there's how much winter is too much winter and how much winter is not enough winter. Um, so you've got to consider both spectrums because of the, you know, the climate situations that we're in, right? When we're dealing with snow and ice, um, you know, Simon talked about how you need the sun, but for snow and ice, that is like the, the thing that ruins the, the, the integrity of an artistic work that an artist has done. And if you want something to last more than just one week, um, you need to consider that. Um, so there's, we, we've had water loot, we've experienced it, where it's rained throughout the entire first weekend and the snow um, ice carvers just before the judging panel comes by because of all the rain, it's, it, the, the ice sculpture collapses just before the judging can finish. Um, we've, you know, so there's all these things that you have to consider um, and, you know, you, you have to put together a contingency plan um, as you're, you know, as you're finalizing your programming, you think about all your conditions, you think about rain, freezing rain, um, wind chill, a little bit of snow that turns into a blizzard, all of those things. And with each of your programming elements, you need to consider, can I, um, before you even consider cancellation, can you postpone it by a few hours? Do you have a rain date? Can you shorten the duration? Um, can, can you move it to another location? If it was something outdoors, can you move it indoors? So a lot of those things, you do need to have that in mind when you are programming something, because really it comes down to health and safety. Um, you know, uh, because um, I have fallen, I have fractured my ankle during winter loot. Um, and the hospital staff here in, in Ottawa, they call winter loot fractulute um, because they see so many people who do come um, because it's, it's the icy conditions, right? Those are things that you really need to be cognizant of when you have public that are going around, when you, you, you want to protect your artists, your contractors, your staff, your volunteers, and, and of course the public. So those are the, the first aid components. Those are things. And, and also when there is a wind chill and you have public health that's telling you frostbite warning, do not go outside. You, you as a programmer do need to then be ready to make that call and say, I'm going to cancel. We're going to cancel. You know, unfortunately, it's just we can't go against public health. That's what we had to do with the Canada 150 closing celebrations on Parliament Hill. The wind chill was like between minus 40 and minus 50. We couldn't put the artists at risk. We couldn't put the public at risk. So we made the decision um, in a timely manner so that we could and, and so we could communicate to the public. But we did leave the midnight um, pyro show. So that was the only thing we kept going. So those are the considerations you need to keep in mind when you know what can you continue with and what can you not with. I love that. And nice backup plan to always have a bit of pyrotechnics involved because then, you know. Um, Chelsea, do we have any questions from the chat or anything you yourself are dying to ask? I would love to know, Kay, what is your biggest pet peeve when it comes to planning winter events? I might have an idea, but. <laughs> it's it's not so much the planning. It's when um, it's more the the during the run, you know, we've had a lot of snow sculptures, ice sculptures, and the public, they're so keen in wanting to get up close to, to those sculptures because they wanna get that selfie shot, which is, you know, you want that to happen, but it, it puts the artwork at risk, you know, the integrity of the artwork, if they're gonna, I remember one person once telling me that they took their ice climbing gear and climbed the ice sculpture that we had. Um, and it was it was a frightening idea that, that, that that's, that could have happened. Um, or, you know, you see parents who let their kids climb up on a snow sculpture and it's just, 
you want it um, so that everybody can enjoy it, um, but also at, again, health and safety. Um, you know, they they walk behind the barriers, the stanchions, um, and and those are the things that you have to kind of anticipate. And as an event organizer, you still have to kind of, you know, keep a smile on your face um, and kindly ask, you know, people to step away. So it doesn't encourage other people when they see other because there is that tendency. If people see one people and one person doing it, they kind of tend to follow along. So it's it's trying to manage those things. That's amazing. Um, we, I think, I, I did start paying attention to the chat, everyone, and I just noticed Shana mentioned uh, that we have kids climbing on things at Winter Station sometimes, and uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot, and now we kind of have to plan for it. Um, it, you know, it's also keeping in mind that it's a very like family-centered neighborhood. Uh, lots of families come out. The launch day is on family day long weekend. Um, so yeah, thank you so much, Kay. Um, as a sidebar, Kay and I went to university together, but like 10 years ago. So thank you so much. It's so fantastic to collaborate you in a professional um, way. So our next panelist is a city animator with a background in public affairs, storytelling, and fundraiser, fundraising. As co-executive director, he builds curiosity, trust, and support of the Bentway through a growing family of audiences, champions, and partners, while ensuring that the organization remains on budget and on brand. He also happens to be the fantastic new chair of the Board of Directors for East End Arts. Thank you for joining us, Dave Carey. Thanks for having me. Hi, Shana. Hi, Adam. Hi, Chelsea. Right, um, I'm, I'm, I'm so excited to talk about the Bentway and what we're up to uh, this winter. I can confirm that my team is down on site under the gardener building ice right now. Not a good weekend for ice. It was super warm, but they've been working overnights for the past eight days, but they're going to deliver. They're going to deliver. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so I think we're, we're hoping you can start, just tell us a little bit about, I mean, the Bentway is known for some pretty innovative year round programming, including the skate rinks. Uh, yeah. Can let you tell us a little bit about some of the work that you and the team have, have done there in the winters? Previously? Yeah, let me bring up, uh, some slides for y'all. Of a slideshow. I see some familiar faces, uh, in the audience today, including Julian Sleeth, our founding CEO, who would have been on the ground with me for all of this. Um, Amazing. So uh, I'll try to keep things somewhat casual, but just a, a recap of, of who we are at the Bentway. Um, the Gardener, if, for those of you living in Toronto, you probably know the Gardener well and dislike the Gardener uh, very much. Um, this was the uh, the opportunity that uh, we, we came across a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, Toronto, I think, showed a lot of ambition and a lot of ingenuity in bringing this site to life. Uh, so I am the co-executive director of the Bentway Conservancy. We are the independent charity that works closely with the city to bring this site to life and to further develop it. Uh, and we use it as a platform to explore what it means to live in a city and to imagine, um, to imagine new solutions for civic challenges and whether it is a new public space under a highway or a public art performance or a yoga class, we think that city building can take all different forms and can involve all different sorts of people. So our, uh, the first section of the Benway opened in 2018, uh, January 6th. This was literally the coldest day that Toronto has ever had. It set a record for the city. Um, it was like minus 37 degrees plus the wind chill. This was in 2018. I think that Torontonians remember that. That was like a really bad winter. Um, uh, but we really wanted to open the first phase of our site uh, with, a, with a, a bit of a pop. Uh, these are our lovely founding donors, Judy and Will Matthews. Uh, and here are the hundreds and hundreds of people who came out battling both cold and wind. It was a, a beautiful, wonderful day. And I think affirmed for me that Toronto uh, is indeed a winter city, and we don't quite have the fortitude of our friends in Edmonton, but I think that we're, we're getting there. Um, our winter season is uh, centered around uh, recreational programming, including ice skating. We have a 220 meter uh, refrigerated track underneath the highway above. The highway is about four or five stories above ground, so there's lots of air 
Uh, it's remarkably quiet uh, and a wonderful, uh, wonderful experience for the whole family. We've experimented with um, things like curling and icebreak dancing. Um, it's, it's a whole lot of fun. Um, the first thing that we learned in our first year is the importance of, of shelter. Uh, and I think that's coming, that's come through in, uh, in various presentations, including things just now. Uh, when you have people working outside uh, and it gets very, very cold out, uh, both technology and people stop working after about 20 minutes. Uh, and so we've, we had to staff accordingly to have breaks every 20 minutes on very cold days. If you're someone with an iPhone or someone with uh, a Mac laptop, after about 30 minutes out in the cold, it will stop working. Uh, and so if you want to do uh, any performances that require music or any presentations that require projections, uh, keep that in mind. Those were all lessons that we learned in our, our first, in, in our first year. It's particularly hard for our staff to work long shifts outside um, on extremely cold days. And so I think an eye not just for staff safety, but staff morale is extremely important to keep in mind. Um, Echoing what was said earlier about the importance of what we call psychological heat. If there is a fire pit, it doesn't matter if it makes the air any warmer, it will feel, it will definitely feel, feel a lot warmer. Uh, we are in a wind tunnel at the Bentway. We're just a few hundred feet from Lake Ontario, uh, surrounded by high rise condos. Uh, it is the windiest place that I have found in the city, uh, which means that signs fall over, artworks tip over, chairs chairs and signs move in the night because the wind gets so turbulent. Um, so at that point, we actually started uh, putting everything away at nighttime, which added about an hour of work at the end of a very long cold day. But our team, our onsite team um, are pretty incredible and almost always do it with a huge smile on their face. Um, we, we've long wanted um, to return to this. This was uh, something that we did in our first season in 2018, where we complemented our recreational programs with artistic program. The Bentway, we think of ourselves as public art practitioners, uh, but our budget hasn't allowed us to animate the site in winter in this way for quite some time. Uh, but we commissioned uh, six or seven artists in our first year to develop new site-specific work that responded to our site's unique conditions and history and um, sort of looked at the city as both a subject and a canvas. Uh, we have a great project here by an artist named Jimmy Limit, um, who took uh, debris that was found during the construction process and made these beautiful uh, photographs out of them. Uh, we had a, a group called Public Visualization Studio actually projecting skater silhouettes onto the gardener's columns, as well as inserting pre-recorded uh, dance sequences into it. It was quite, quite beautiful. Um, I think artistic programs uh, in the winter time um, have their share of challenges, many of which I've mentioned, including uh, wind and ice uh, and thaw and signage, um, all, all challenges that I think the folks on this call are all, uh, are all up for. Uh, we like to get a little bit silly in winter time because I think everyone needs a little, a little pick me up. So we've both hosted uh, engagements, uh, uh, proposals, as well as figure skating fashion shows, and my favorite, the polar bear skate, uh, which was an idea that everyone on my team thought was the dumbest thing they've ever heard. It was our cheapest event. It only cost us $600 for an EMS crew, and we got on national news across the country. Uh, and look how much fun they're having. Look at those smiles. Um, since the Bentway is uh, an independent charity and not an agency of the city, um, though we are in the receipt of a number of government grants, we think it's really important that, especially in wintertime, that we offer free programming to the public. So we actually don't charge for anything that we do. Um, so corporate partnerships have become a really important piece of our winter season. Um, and being in a big metropolis like Toronto, we have found corporate brands uh, fairly keen to play with. Um, and so this help, helps keep uh, the Bentley free to skate at um, and also solve some of our visitors' needs, like keeping them warm and getting sweet things in their mouths. Uh, and, uh, just, you know, those surprise and delight moments that make things a little extra special. Um, and maybe, maybe, I'll, maybe I'll pause there, but I'm, I'm happy to, to talk about what we're up to for this crazy year ahead. Yeah, this is actually, this was gonna be my next question to you, Dave, mm -hmm. is, because you've 
decided to be open this winter and and I know that there are certain special considerations I think in general folks for the purposes of our of our brainstorming today let's sort of pretend that there's a bit of a, a we're in a bit of a COVID free world in our brainstorming today, but we're all people who are planning for real world events. And so we should acknowledge some of that. And, and I know that the Bentley has come up with some pretty great sounding responsive plans. So Dave, if you want to take it away and talk about that, that'd be awesome. Yeah, you know, entering the, entering the season, we knew that COVID was going to complicate things and make things frankly more difficult and, and more expensive. Um, so although the the gathering limits in Toronto restrict the number of people that we can host at any one time uh, to, to 25. Um, we thought it was important because for those 25 people that we can host, it's going to be a special, hopefully magical uh, experience. So we were doing timed entry for the first time, uh, which aligns with the city of Toronto's practices for their own skating rinks. Um, uh, Pre-registration, we're releasing tickets every week. Um, we felt like People can plan about a week and ahead these days, but if people book now for something at the end of January, we'll probably get no shows. And I've um, heard that at some of the city run skating rinks, people are already booking skate time yeah. in, in late January and February. So there's something really, I think, accessible and equitable about limiting it to a week yeah. before. Love yeah. that. Um, our first week went on went on for sale, although they're they're free tickets, uh, went for sale uh, on I think just three days ago and we sold out within two hours, which indicates to me that people are hungry and desperate to get outside. Um, part of the reason we're doing pre-registration is that we need to be able to do contact tracing, which is a very, a very real issue. Um, so as much as we like the idea of having uh, a walk-up line, which we will have in case people don't show up, that means that people are going to be outside trying to either use a, an iPad to enter their information or writing with a pen and then we have to throw that pen out or sanitize it. It just becomes um, all the more all the more complicated. Uh, we are not doing skate rentals this year. So it's only for people who own their own skates. On a usual year, more than half of our attendees would do that. That's uh, to avoid um, unneeded interaction between people face to face. We're also unfortunately not doing any hot chocolate or operating a bar. It's just too many people gathering together and frankly far too expensive for us because uh, we are going to be bubbling our staff um, into three separate cohorts. Um, if there is an infection in one of our staff or in one of our staff's housemates, people that they live with, uh, that entire team will go off the grid until a, COVID, a negative COVID test returns, uh, which means that we're hiring more than twice the number of people that uh, we ought to be. But such is the such is the way of the world right now. We are paying our part-time staff if they need to stay home while they await their their COVID test, um, because we can't encourage anyone to consider income versus coming in when they might be sick. If you're sick, you stay home. You still get paid. Um, again, making making things incredibly more complicated and and more expensive. Uh, but but it is what it is. Uh, someone mentioned blankets earlier. We will not have any blankets on site this year. Uh, because to really do that well, we would need a separate set of blankets for each cohort, which just becomes overly complicated. I love the idea of blankets. In our first year, we, we, we finally found decent fire retardant blankets because they were next to our fire pits. Uh, and then we realized that we had to clean them on a regular basis. Uh, we further realized in our first year of skating that many um, cleaning products freeze when it gets too cold. So if you're trying to use Clorox at minus 37 degree weather, you spray the Clorox and it freezes to the table that you're trying to clean. Um, so that that is some of some of what we're planning uh, to respond to COVID for this year. But I think the response has been overwhelmingly positive. So Sounds I think anything lovely. that anyone wants to do in winter time and do it safely, yeah. people are gonna people are gonna come out. Absolutely. Uh, Chelsea, do we have any questions from the chat? We're, we're all running a little bit behind because everything that we're talking about is so fascinating. So if there are no questions, are, are there? There are no questions. Um, I was personally interested to know, Dave, I, I have an idea, but um, what your favorite outdoor winter event has been that you've planned with the Bentley and why? Um, oh gosh, it's totally the polar bear skate because I just okay. think it's it's the dumbest idea I've ever had. And my that's definitely my favorite. Love it. 
amazing. Thanks Our, for listening, everybody. Oh, thanks for joining us, Dave. Really, it's it's great to hear about some of the amazing things that are happening and in, in, in such a dense urban space too. I think it's it's easy to think about needing vestation and from that dense urban space, our next panelist joins us from a more rural environment and they are the artistic director of the Department of Illumination, whose mission is to bring joy and creativity to the people of Prince Edward County, Ontario, by producing festivals, workshops, and other artistic events. Krista Dalby is a multidisciplinary artist with a passion for community building, exemplified by her co-founding of the Firelight Lantern Festival in 2013, and founding the winter art festival Icebox in 2019. Krista is the recipient of the 2019 Community Arts Builder Award from Prince Edward County Arts Council and the 2016 Arts Recognition Award from the Quinty Arts Council. And she was one of the first people to ever hire me for a gig in the community arts. Krista Dalby, welcome. Thank you so much for having me here today, Adam. And uh, everyone, this has been really inspiring so far. So hope to carry on. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to be get your slideshow going. Get my slideshow going. And um, I'm hoping that that slideshow will tell us a bit about Icebox. It looks like it will. It will. Um, don't know why it's doing this now. It always does. It's always right on the mark. Tested it a bunch we, of times. Yep, we literally tested it before. I was thinking yes. this morning about that that project all those many many years ago and how completely against COVID it was. Krista hired. Oh, I know we've done so many oh anti COVID yeah. projects. I, yeah, I think oh. I hugged about six hundred strangers for that that project in Duffin Grove Park a million years ago. Yes, and uh, you know that would certainly not fly now. Am I going to be? and then yeah it as view as a slideshow is that we'll cut this part out for the people on youtube so <sighs> Sorry, everybody, guys. everybody just do do show, show Have a little your, stretch while i'm working uh, this out you know and uh, i think it's probably good the other thing we could do is just look at it in in its weird little mode sure it's it is a little weird but it'll be fine okay slide master no this is why so many of us hire you know lighting and sound i know i wish i had somebody to do this for me anyways we're just gonna do it in this weird, it'll be weird view it'll be so hi everybody happy Thank to be you. here i'm here to talk to you about Icebox, which is a winter festival we started two years ago in Prince Edward County. I have a bunch of my artists uh, on the call today as well, so happy to see them here. Krista, so we were. If I could make one request. Sorry, yeah. would it be possible to zoom in on the on the slide itself on the bottom right corner? Um, there's the possibility yes. to just zoom in. Whoa, too. too much. There we go. That's better. Okay, Thank you. that is better. Thank you. Good advice. Um, so we were lucky enough to find a very wonderful partner, which is uh, a local uh, municipal museum. Um, so uh, we install uh, for the last two years these five colorful wooden huts on the lawn of this museum, which is the historic house you see in the background, as well as this church to the side. And uh, each one of these huts has a uh, art installation by a different artist or a team of artists. And uh, really the idea is to create for uh, nine days a cultural creative hub in our rural community. It's all completely for free. And uh, we have, in addition to the art installations, we have many different activities that take place over the course of two weekends. And then during the week we host school visits where we have hundreds of kids come through and see the art. So many of our artists choose to do community engaged projects, both with children and with adults. So this is one of our artists who did a map, a mapping exercise of our community um, with a bunch of school kids. And uh, this is another artist, Nella Kassin. Uh, she does some um, textile art and embroidery specifically. So in addition to her work, there is also work from community members. We have usually a month of workshops before the event. So 
We had the Icebox Stitchers Society who met weekly and made small pieces of embroidery which uh, were contributed to this installation. Um, as you'll notice, we have um, um, plastic corrugated roofs on our buildings. There is no electricity to any of the buildings. We really embraced low tech. Um, that is just kind of how we roll. So um, yeah, dressing properly becomes very important. Um, so one of the challenges that the artists faced when creating their installations was how do you um, create artwork that can sustain uh, very cold temperatures over a long period of time, possibly moisture, and also thousands of people handling it. So this is some um, uh, paper works that are incredibly int intricate by uh, Chrissy Poitras and Jenna Cush. So they're like pop-up books on a wall. And every person that comes in them is manhandling bas them basically in order to appreciate them. So really, uh, yeah, it was a bit of an experiment of like what we can do in these boxes. Um, we had a lot of our installations also have an interactive component. So this was a, a portraiture uh, uh, workshops that one of our artists had done with a bunch of youth, which is very interesting for youth to uh, have to draw their own self portraits and then uh, participants could come into the booth and um, draw each other's portraits on this plexiglass, which created this whole overlapping uh, beautiful tapestry of, of faces by everyone from children to professional artists. It was really quite wonderful. Um, so next up I have a PSA, which is if you don't find the joy in winter, you will have the same, you'll have a lot less joy, but the same amount of winter. So it's really attitude, uh, attitude is really everything. Uh, so we have a lot of activities that take place every single day of our, our of our icebox. Um, my absolute favorite thing is our dances. We have outdoor dances around the fire pit with our wonderful choreographer, Arwen Carpenter. And uh, it is honestly just one of the most freeing, joyous things you've ever done is to dance in the snow with a bunch of your friends and neighbors and strangers and children and adults and everybody. It's really one of the most beautiful things. We are like really, really into costumes. So we leave costumes lying around and people put them on. Um, we really treat the, the outdoor landscape as a canvas and we sort of layer all of these different elements on top of it. Uh, last year, we had a wonderful theater performance in the woods on this. The museum site is quite large. So we had a procession out, to the, out into the woods and uh, this beautiful uh, performance, uh, puppetry performance by Birdbone Theater took place out there. We do have a few non-arts related activities that we layer in as well. This was snow pants yoga for families that we had. Uh, we've also done things like snowshoeing expeditions, maple taffy on snow, all that sort of stuff. We do actually use the church quite a bit for some of our programming. We do indoor workshops, basically things that are not appropriate to do outside. We have concerts. Again, musicians do not like playing in the cold. So we've had some really wonderful concerts and workshops in the church as well. Uh, food and drink is, of course, very important to keep people fueled up. So we have the Icebox Snack Shack here. Um, with our famous uh, unicorn hot chocolate, because who doesn't love to drink a colorful hot chocolate? And uh, yeah, lots of fun. Uh, processions, like we love to parade around together. Um, again, using really the winter landscape as um, a tapestry of what we can layer on these flags. We're really into flags as well, um, and costumes, and uh, everything just stands out so beautifully on a nice blanket of snow. Um, of course, fire spinners are an excellent thing to do outdoors in the winter and, uh, you know, uh, we don't have any fire spinners in Prince Edward County, so we have to import them. These are from uh, Trellis Entertainment in Peterborough, who are wonderful to work with. If anybody is looking to hire some fire spinners, I would highly recommend them. Um, we're really into ceremonies. We always have an opening ceremony and then we have a closing ceremony. This is me last February, burning our worries one month before COVID started. Little did I know what we were in store for. This box was full, but uh, we would have needed a much bigger box, I think, if we knew what was coming. Um, yeah, again, love and costumes. This is part of our closing ceremony. These are uh, a lot of our core artists and um, 
for our closing ceremony, we, uh, we actually in the church, we lay out like 100 costumes and just anybody can come and put on anything they want. And people have these weird mix and match stuff. It's uh, really a tremendous amount of fun. And um, this is our installation crew. So each of these buildings is modular. It is four walls, a floor platform, a ceiling, and then this plastic roofing that goes on top. This is, these are all entirely put together by this team of wonderful volunteers. And uh, it's a mix of some of our artists are in here, but a lot of these people are not artists. They are community members who want to be involved and want to be a part of something that's bigger than themselves. And we installed last year in an ice storm and look how much fun these people are having. Like they were having a blast and it did not matter that the weather was terrible. Again, it's really attitude is everything. And um, super proud to be a part of this community of, of people who are really, uh, willing to go for it and yeah it's amazing and community is kind of my my first question for you because it seems like at every point that you've described there's really big community buy-in and my question is are the people in prince edward county braver about winter or is it something that you did to really like build that community support for the event i would say um no people are not more into winter uh that's I would what i was say, hoping though, you would say i would say though if you are not into hockey there is not much to do here in the winter hockey really rules all and so those of us who are like you know more into culture we like when somebody gives us an opportunity to get together and do something interesting um yeah people are all over it um, also, because it's free, people can come multiple days, they can stay as long as they want, even when we have things with capacity, we just, there are still like concerts, it's still free, they just have to register in advance. And um, yeah, amazing. It is still a struggle on a day when it's like minus 25. I'm really struggling to get people out still. Yeah. Um, it's it is, a, it is a challenge of getting across that mindset to people of just dress properly, trust me, come and you will have fun. It will be totally worth it. Yeah, amazing. Um, I wonder if you have a few minutes to tell us a little bit about what you're planning this year for 2021. Again, you know, we're for our imaginary events today, we're going to pretend that there's no such thing as COVID, but I'm hoping that you can just inform us a little bit about how you've done your I'm not going to say it's a pivot, maybe it's a pirouette. It is a pirouette. Thank you for thank you for being so <laughs> perceptive. Um, yeah, so this event just takes an absolute ton of time to put together. So we decided actually quite a long time ago we were going to cancel it this year. And then we got a grant. So we're like, okay, I guess we have to spend this grant. So what we are going to do is we're doing an ice box at home this year. We're going to have a box of things that the artists are putting together of activities, snacks, nice things to make you feel cozy. It's going to be complemented by some online programming. Uh, for example, um, Arwen, who's the lovely dancer and choreographer we work, work with, she's going to be having online dance parties every day. And that will culminate at the end of the nine days. And we're going to do some flash dance flash mobs outside of nursing homes. So there will be some real world tie-ins. We're doing um, an art show that's going to be outdoors somewhere. We haven't figured that out yet. Um, there are there will be sort of a few sort of real world things happening, but it will mostly be living in these boxes that people can order and online. I love that. It sounds absolutely like a pirouette. <laughs> um, Chelsea, do we have uh, uh, any questions from the chat for our our brilliant Krista? We do have one. I think it's referring to uh, something Krista was talking about a minute ago. But the question is, what were your community buy-in strategies? If you wanted to elaborate more on that. Mm, great. You bet. Well, thankfully, we already had uh, quite a reputation in the community, having produced another festival, the Firelight Lantern Festival, for many years. So we do have um, an audience. Um, the digital, I mean, pardon me, the community building strategies we really use is before the festival starts of having workshops, which we try to make free. So we have done workshops in schools with kids, and then they all want to come and they all want to bring their families to show what they made. Um, we've had everything from like creative writing workshops, 
uh, printmaking workshops, you, uh, you name it. We try to get people hooked in early and then so they all want to come and see their work and bring their families. And uh, yeah, definitely by making it free is really helpful, I would say. Amazing. Folks, we've gone over time. So I was going to do a whole horse and pony show about our fantastic moderators that we have to go through each of the breakout rooms. And instead, I'm going to let them just be fantastic. But I will tell you a little bit about the rooms and who's moderating and then you can all go and jump into your breakout rooms together. I really hope that everyone is feeling as inspired as I am. There are no limits on what you can collectively dream up today. Um, so here are in no particular order the locations for which you will be imagining something. We have the 7-Eleven parking lot at Don Lands in Danforth moderated by Shana Hillman, nothing but the best for our uh, glamorous executive director here at East End Arts. We will have St. Matthew's Clubhouse on Riverdale Park East, moderated by Jacqueline Rodriguez. We will have Kew Gardens and Beach, moderated by Safira Charles. We will have Taylor Creek Park, moderated by Lanrick Bennett Jr. And each of you have already been pre-assigned to one of these rooms. And so when our Zoom genius, Carissa, presses the big red button, I will not press the button because I will break it and I am terrified of technology. But Carissa will push the button and you will have 15 minutes to imagine, design, create, invent, whatever you want centered around each of these locations. I really hope everyone will incorporate some of, I. there are a few little through lines that I've noticed in some of our panelists discussions today. I am sure some of you have noticed different ones. Don't worry too much about COVID or funding or any of that. The goal here is to have fun. The goal here is to stretch our imaginations a little bit and dream really big and not worry too much because I think like, if we have some ideas, when we need one, we'll be able to grab it from the pile, right? And so I am going to ask Carissa to push the button in just a minute, not just quite yet, because then after the, after the breakout sessions, you're all gonna come back. You're gonna point someone from your group and they will have four minutes to present what you have created. Remember that you wanna appoint a note taker and I, would, I will be asking for that note taker to share their notes with us. Not so that I can steal your ideas necessarily. There are no promises I have been known to steal ideas in the past. Uh, so is everyone ready? Does anyone need to like fetch their coffee? Does anyone need anything? Carissa, are you ready? Push the button. I don't know what's going to happen. Push the button. I'll just come flying back in. Yeah. Ugh. They're going to stop mid-sentence, probably. Yeah, great. <laughs> ah, there you are, Patty. I'm so glad that you're with us today, Patty. It's so great to see you. I don't know what keeps saying that. All right. I'm excited by what we just all talked about. Tell you oh, yeah. So great. So great. I'm going to sign anyone to talk, so I don't know if she appears on, on the send yet, but... Well, is everyone back? I think so. That was a little like it was like you have two minutes and then all of a sudden we're like, woo, we're back. No. Yeah. So we're we're going over time and I'm trying to make sure that everyone has enough time to maybe get outside before it's actually dark out today because I think we should all actually go and be outside. And yes, Rob and I absolutely agree that the breakout times were too short and it's only because we all have such exciting things to to learn about and you know the, maybe this is something that we get to do again um so we are going to go in order from east to west starting with saint matthew's clubhouse who from that group is going to be presenting your almost certainly not a fully planned event jacqueline I'm hey. Alyssa, you're just on mute. There you are. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I was like, where's my mute button? Also, okay. where's my notes? <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, hi, Melissa. Thank you. Hi. Right. Um, four minutes. Okay, four minutes. It's cool. We don't really... About 4.15, folks. So if people have other meetings that they obviously 
would prefer to slough off instead of leaving this one, let folks know, okay? Thank you all so much for those of you who do have to leave. But in the meantime, Melissa, go. I'm in. Okay, so we don't have a fully formed idea, but yeah. um, we talked a lot about um, we talked a lot about uh, so so sorry. I'm just going to give so St. Matthew's Clubhouse. It's the home of East End Arts, and it's in a beautiful park. There are washrooms, and it's popular already for tobogganing. Electricity is available. Um, and event coordinator, coordinators can rent St. Matthew's Clubhouse, but it cannot be open for the public. Uh -huh. um, there is, uh, it is a large population of families living in the neighborhood. Um, so we talked about the tobogganing was sort of the first thing that we hooked onto. Um, and from there, the discussion kind of came into like, could we possibly um, bring back tobogganing for adults? So, um, can we elevate tobogganing so that it, there's maybe a light show as part of it, um, a refreshments, food markets, uh, lanterns, maybe there's a musical component and some installation component to it where we could actually bring in and highlight um, local artists. Uh, and we also talked about this being a weekly event so that each week there could be a highlight of, um, uh, of a new artist. And then that sort of uh, broadened into um, like, can there be snow angel competitions or not competitions, but just like snow angel centers and um, snow sculptures so that this kind of becomes a bit of like an adult playtime. <laughs> I love that. Which is where it's like, it goes back to one of the panelists that I can't remember who exactly was talking about, um, you know, children don't care about the, the, the temperature. They just want to run out. So can we bring that joy into uh, winter for adults? I love it. Um, and then um, the, we talked about it being weekly because you can build a sort of a ritual uh, aspect to it. So um, it's something that it gives the community something that they can center around each week. Um, but then we decided that we might want to broaden it so that it starts earlier in the evening so that families can be included, but it, that it goes a little bit later in the night as well. So, you know, those whose bedtime might be a tad later, which is not me, but for no, those I, me neither, but... being, um, can stay out and enjoy sort of a nightlife aspect to it um, so that it could be for both adults and families. Um, what makes this a perfect winter event is that we'd be looking to shift our culture so that we embrace winter just like kids do. Um, however, we are looking at the cold. Um, we need heating stations as well as possibly portable fire pits. Um, maybe these fire pits are also part of the installation process uh, to make them uh, visible, uh, visually uh, enticing. Right. Um, there was also some talk about. Um, just going back to that aspect of a ritual, um, taking things that we might normally do indoors and doing them outdoors um, so that we can kind of normalize what, uh, what winter is like. And uh, the example given was a weekly outdoor choir. So maybe there's like, that's part of the musical element to oh. it. Um, oh, oh, that's, that's great, I'm done. <laughs> okay, cancel, oh gosh. I don't know how to turn it off. Wow. Excellent work, Team SMC. I, I'm in. I think it sounds great. Next up, moving further further east, we have the 7-Eleven parking lot at Donlands and Danforth. And you have four minutes starting now. I'm going to throw it to Francine, who was busy taking all kinds of amazing notes. Amazing. Thank you, Francine. All right, so um, just a background on the 7-Eleven parking lot for those who aren't familiar. It's located right outside Donland Station. Um, it is covered by a beautiful mural by the artist Elixir and no longer operates as a 7-Eleven, um, is now a vacant building surrounded by the mural. So um, what, we, what we sort of talked about is that this area is very culturally and ethnically diverse, especially with the mosque right down the street. A lot of families in this area, Greek town bordering the other side. So we do have a lot of, um, of, of different communities intersecting and um, talking about how we can celebrate that and bring these people together. So um, we identified a time in which a lot of the community is out and that's sort of the end of the work day um, when people are coming home from work, um, afternoon prayers have just finished in the mosque. This is a time where um, 
people are generally out and about and in that general area. So um, we thought of how we can bring these people to enjoy the space in an outdoor um, focused event in the parking lot. Um, the building, the inside is accessible, but we would use it more as a back of house area, access to volunteer holding, there's bathrooms there, et cetera. So we do wanna focus on having um, the, the, the majority of it being outdoors. Um, and one of the first things we noticed as well is that it is a shorter building. Um, and so making use of that vertical space, especially for a visual element is mm. would be mostly our priority. Um, to sort of bring people in. So we talked about um, using roof installations, possibly using um, puppets as some sort of um, uh, installation visually to bring people in, to encourage participation of people who maybe just wanted to, um, you know, take a selfie and move on, but it gives people the option to see that beacon coming off the subway or leaving the mosque or just walking down the street to come in and have um, people enjoy the event. And so um, just echoing on things that Simon had shared, we want to make use of warmer colors, the use of light to um, communicate that warmth um, to the um, to the people that are coming. Um, and then in the parking lot themselves, we talked about having people being able to um, have this event be what they want. So if we have interactive elements like other um, shadow puppets or costumes elements that people of any age can interact with, um, that's something that people who want to have their like you be hands-on physically involved with the event can do. Um, but then there's also other options that are um, maybe a little bit more relaxed for people that just wanna sit by a fire to sit and enjoy watching the event go mm -hmm. by. Um, there's the possibility for people to interact with the event in whatever capacity they feel, um, as well as adding um, greenery for um, just visual aesthetics, but also with a practical purpose for blocking the wind and also some traffic from the road. Um, this would kind of create um, a sense of uh, uh, a specific space within the parking lot by surrounding it with um, evergreens or, or trees or that sort of thing, um, just to create a singular type of zone in which this event is happening. Um, we've also kind of talked about activities um, to be transitionary from winter to spring. We have one of our members bring up um, kind of a winter maypole dance idea and the idea Ooh. that warmth can also come from physical movement and participation, which right. is something we can encourage to people, you know, actually move around and, and interact with the space as well. So um, like the previous we didn't settle on something specific, but um, a lot of different elements that could create um, a really vibrant and dynamic event in the space. I love it. You have 10 seconds left. Uh, that's really all I had. So I thank you for really, listening, everybody. <laughs> yeah, I think in particular, the idea of like a bit of a, a like using the height. Oh, my God. What do I do now? Um, I don't know how my phone works, guys. It's all lies. It's all lies. I love the idea of something above because it is quite a, a flat roofed squat little building. Um, and I love it. I love it. I'm going to that one, too. And next, we're going to go down south to Q Beach, and we're going to have a presentation from Safira. Do you want to talk to us about what your group imagined at Q Beach or the gardens behind? You no, know I'm going to, well, I'm going to pass it along to Patty because she was okay. a note taker and long time resident of the beaches, and she's Maybe. very knowledgeable of the neighborhood. So Patty, you can take it. Four minutes starting now. Hi, Patty. Okay, Sophia, thank you for, I had no idea that was going to happen if I took notes. Okay. <laughs> um, so the first thing oh, you want, I, I could speak if you want, like it doesn't yeah, matter, yeah. however you feel comfortable. Please, please or... <laughs> put in, I, I might miss something, okay? Sure. Um, sure. We had a great group and uh, we dove right in. Sophia talked about the, what this uh, environment was like at Q Gardens. And, um, you know, we talked about how there's a number of activities that already happen at Kew Gardens, including um, there's a, there's a uh, pavilion there that people do yoga or different kinds of things that they do. And we talked about the fact that the boardwalk is also like a really dominant presence in the beach, but there's also a lot of natural environments. Somebody mentioned about how the city is actually trying to bring back um, some of its natural environments by putting in like, I know that there's bee gardens and there's mm -hmm. other efforts to increase biodiversity. 
And uh, we talked about having um, integrating, there happened to be Andres in our group who is from Birds Canada. So we started talking about how to integrate birds into um, this whole environment, which are so, it's so critical for that. For we, we think of dogs often in this neighborhood, but there's also an amazing abundance of birds. And so Andre spoke about how we could put in um, uh, a large infrastructure to support birds, either bird feeders or bring them into something, um, maybe even a larger piece of infrastructure where birds can be viewed um, they can want, they be viewed feeding, and it could be something that uh, attracted the whole family down to really integrate help birds. And then we got the folks from Clay and Paper Theater, who were also in our group, and they started talking about how we can integrate um, puppets into this to really explore the biodiversity of here, and maybe even integrate some sort of profession, uh, procession along the boardwalk oh, yeah. that uh, people could bring their own lighting structures. So we can tie this whole notion of light and nature through birds with, with the imagery of the puppetry and um, I really explore what's happening down there by, with these vehicles of nature, puppetry, light to look what's happening to the biodiversity down there. Um, and so, um, Sabir, I did, is that pretty okay, much says it? Thank you so much, Patty. That was amazing. Yeah, our group was really amazing. Um, so uh, also there's the, ma the macro, um, the larger infrastructure to view birds and whatnot, but also we talked about having micro infrastructures like along queue or even along the boardwalk for such as um, bird feeders, small bird architecture um, to, so that birds can congregate and it could, they could be bird baths, bird feeders all in one. So I think these little infrastructures along that vicinity would be quite amazing. Um, it, it really got me thinking of the, the true like magical instance at Q is that, does everybody know there's this large tree and there's this small like micro like door and then you look inside the little things like if we can recreate these small environments throughout with um sort of promoting and instilling uh um and inviting um wildlife birds uh, marietta also talked about the foxes there's a huge attraction with the foxes and sort of doing something around that near the boardwalk as well some sort of infrastructure to invite wildlife and uh, that's about it. Like we had a great group. We had a great talk and thank you everyone. And thank you for having me. Nailed it. Yay. <laughs> All right, next we have Taylor Creek. Ready, set, go. I don't know who from Taylor Creek is gonna present. I just, I'm, I'm just having too much fun now. Um, Lanrick, do you wanna talk? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, uh, Bearcat, uh, I know you were taking, I don't know if she can hear me. If you were taking notes, do you mind? Uh, uh, presenting uh, what the the notes that uh, that we took on uh, Taylor Creek. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Um, it's, sorry, I'm just I'm I'm on like a kick, so I'm going to correct you in the pronunciation of my name. Please. It's Bereket. Bereket. Um, thank you. And um, we didn't have a, a really specific um plan but we talked about a number of different considerations for the space so uh primary one was what the goal was so whether or not the intention was to keep it as more of a pristine nature space or whether the goal was really to try to create more active animations that would bring people in and and change the dynamic of it a little bit and so um and then um, in both instances, one of the big considerations we talked about was safety. So thinking about lighting um, and also in terms of the fires. So how to do that in a way that would uh, encourage people to feel safe coming into the space um, while also obviously there's active fire thinking about fire safety. Um, one of the interesting fire ideas that we talked about were metal sculptures that um, have fire inside of them and then the, the there's holes along the exterior of the sculpture so you see the flames coming out um, but the fire is contained within that sculpture. Uh, another really interesting idea was around using snow as a, a screen or a canvas for projections. Um, 
Uh, also think, thinking about wayfinding, um, knowing that probably a lot of people aren't familiar with the space. So how best to orient people towards the space and also help them navigate through it and understand what the mm. different offerings within it are. Um, we had run really lovely idea um, to have at like either like things around discoverability. So some of those were around uh, dance could there be a guided dance tour that would move people through the space, perhaps over the bridges in a square along the river? So kind of linking the movement of the river to um, people's movement. Uh, another interesting idea around geocaching. So um, people use more of like an adventuring idea using a compass to navigate the space. Um, also, some really lovely ideas around land stewardship and ways that um, perhaps if there were art installations, the art installations could respond to some of the invasive species. So it could be an educational opportunity to teach people about invasive species, to do some um, management of those species, and then to take what's been removed and turn it into sculptures or things that people can interact with and look at. Um, particularly, we were talking about invasive grapevines. Um, another idea around fire was having uh, some central fireplaces that could also act as uh, storytelling hubs. So places that could be, um, people could be invited to do storytelling around the fires, both about the history of the place um, the history of the animals in the place and the, the ecosystem that exists there. Uh, and also thinking about the fact that in the winter, um, because the leaves have fallen, oh. there's a lot more visibility around wildlife. So what are some of the ways that um, the space could be structured such that people could be encouraged to discover some of the wildlife that lives there and that's much more visible during winter time? Um, also, it. it's quite a linear park, so thinking through a, a skating corridor could be something interesting. And we also talked about sledding and tobogganing as, as things that are really fun and um, wanting the space to be one where people could have fun. Oh, uh, I love it. Time is up. We okay. Are over. Everything that you have proposed sounds wonderful. We are very quickly before I wrap things up. We're going to do a quick little poll and we're going to vote on the event. St. Matthew's Clubhouse, Adult Fun Time Outside Tobogganing, 7 Eleven, Puppets on the Rooftop, Q Beach, Birds by the Boardwalk, Taylor Creek. I'm getting a very like um, winter wonderland something from Taylor Creek, like the, the permanent metal sculptures with the fire and the projections on snow. So, like, I'm hearing fairyland in, in, in the ravine. I'm going to launch the poll. Everyone vote quickly. There's no prize, only glory. Go. I don't know how polls work. Ah. Poll in progress. Poll in progress. St. Matthew's Clubhouse, adult fun time. 7-Eleven, puppets on the rooftop. I feel like the characters from the mural are going to come out into the puppets, and I'm into that. Q Beach, we're going to have like a bird parade. We're going to do like a thing where the foxes are chasing the birds, and that's going to be fun. Taylor Creek, we've got like beautiful, lit up wilderness fairy wonderland. Okay. And Robin, absolutely, you let me know. The other thing I want to say right now note takers, I love all of you. Please, I don't care what form your notes are in, email them to me. Adam, A-D-A-M, at eastendarts.ca. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. Has everyone voted? I have no idea. End poll. Did anybody vote? It doesn't look like it. Yes. Yes. Share results. It looks like Q Beach Gardens. Oh. Nose, by a fox's nose. By a fox's <laughs> nose. Shana, will you take a screenshot? Because it does not show me the results. Oh. <laughs> Amazing. As I like take a picture of my phone. With your phone. Yeah, great. We're the most high tech ever. Okay, folks, this has been absolutely joyful for me. And that's the part that counts the most. 
I'm just kidding. It's been really, it's been really wonderful to hear. Thank you so much to our moderators, to our note takers, of course, to our panelists. Thank all of you for coming. A uh, special shout out to the Department of Canadian Heritage for financial support for the event, to the City of Toronto for their ongoing support of East End Arts, and to the individual foundation and corporate sponsors who actually make up the bulk of East End Arts budget. It's big shout out to Carissa Ainsley. In case you can't tell, there's no way we could have done this without a technical genius. Best board member ever. It's a, it's a tie. All the board members are great. Um, and to Chelsea for being so on top of questions in the chat window. Thank you. We're going to save the chat. There's some amazing resources in there. We're going to share as much of this information as we can with all of you. Please, let's keep the conversation going. Share ideas. Share things you've learned. If you like events like this and you want us to do more of them, please let us know. You can do that again by emailing me, adam at eastendarts.ca, or you could let us know that you liked this by making your charitable donation. Note that this was the event that you wanted to, to donate to support. And as, as I'm sure everyone in this room knows, organizations like East End Arts exist on the, you know, the support of our community. So thank you, all of you, for being here. This has been a joy. And, and I kind of can't wait to do it again. I kind of think that some of these ideas are really great. And, and I just, I, I thank all of you. This, this has been, it's been so much fun. Thank you, everyone.